Peter was always the brightest of my mother's children. Although there may have been a prodigy or two sprung forth from the overactive lines, lines of Pa without her help. On blackout nights at her house during the 80s, my mother would gather us around a lamp. And while my father was either out drinking with friends or thrusting furiously into some hapless girl as gullible and slim and as smitten as his wife once was, have the five of us play quiz games using an old and battered copy of the student's companion. In eloquence, I've come to believe, is much more than a deficiency of expression. Faced with a greater overwhelming eloquence, it will often mutate into a deficiency of formulation. This is true of emotional ineloquence as it is of intellectual ineloquence. <laughs> Communal fanaticism, tribal rage, thrives more on this mutation of ineloquence than it does in true ignorance. The clearest memory I have of Peter in his youth, before the bitterness, was from those blackout nights with her mother quizzing us from that handed down student's companion. I hear her voice, thin and echoing, ghost-like, feeling away into its own ellipses, a place where birds are kept. And Peter's image stands out dramatic, in dramatic candlelit relief, surrounded by the haze of the rest of my siblings, as he asserts without fail, an aviary. So it would go through apiary, aquarium, hutch, warren, sty, insectarium. It is not that the rest of us did not, did not learn all the answers over time. We did. But long before we did, and long after, our original ignorance and relative ineloquence had become incorporated into that familial ritual. In the end, Pitambur became the spokesman for all of us. The single correspondence between Peter and I in the nine years since I left for Canada was a short, cryptic letter he sent me, just as Hawk had entered its infancy. I have it in my Toronto apartment still. Indeed, I know it from memory by now. What is an aviary, Prakash? An aviary is a place where birds are kept. Where birds are kept despite plumage and temperament and origin. All that is important is that they can mutually endure their confinement for no greater purpose than some perverse and unnatural exhibition. My name is Royal Johnson. I come from a tiny country um, in South America called Guyana. Renowned for being the only English speaking country in um, South America, and we have much more in common with the Anglophone Caribbean countries like Jamaica and Barbados and Trinidad. Um, what I do? I write. <coughs> um, in my spare time, I write as much as I can, um, both fiction and poetry, but I also um, have been working on um, some screenplays. I, my official job, what I do for a living, uh, which I've done unofficially. Well, my official job is that I'm, I advise on cultural policy for the Ministry of Education in Ghana, which also covers culture. Um, it's a sort of an extension or con continuation of advocacy work I've been doing for a fairly long time. Um, and so when there was a change in government, I was asked to come on board and sort of transmute my advocacy into actual policy formulation. We've had a history of <coughs> both producing, I would say, world class writers, <coughs> uh, originally from Guyana, but a suppression of real, really free literary content at home. What's that re what, what, what that's resulted in is the fact that um, much of Guyanese history um, has been left unexamined by literature. And so the best thing for now, um, and our, our reforms in government have been increasingly well, fluctuating, but now we're at a point in which they could be, I think, um, quantifiably more democratic than, say, in the past 10 years. What has resulted in is that we, <laughs> there's a new generation of writers who now have an opportunity not just to examine um, contemporary Guyanese reality, but also look at and turn their imagination to these vast swathes swath of um, history that have been <laughs> unexamined not just by literature, but also by history, um, histori historiography itself. Um, <laughs> so that is the most, um, I think, exciting and the best thing about writing from Guyana now. The worst thing is that that very same system of um, either outright suppression or what I like to call sort of malign neglect 
of um, literary um, infrastructure, infrastructure for the production of literature, means that much of what it takes to produce literature, um, technical um, capacity building programs, uh, <laughs> the curriculum in schools, uh, publishing facilities are non-existent in Ghana. Although we do have uh, the Ghana Prize for Literature, which is a major prize outside of that, and despite that, in fact, um, we have virtually no infrastructure. Easy. That's the the best thing about us is our um, cultural and ethnic diversity. Um, we uh, we have people from virtually all over the world. Um, in I think in more equitable quantities than exist than exist elsewhere, um, and that's that is <laughs> increasingly evolving to be so. Um, and the fact that we we're at a stage where we've, we've gone from um, having, because of that diversity and because of history of colonialism, um, sort of very rabid ethnic competition um, as expressed in its politics, in our politics. So what we've had is that we have the diversity as a strength, but we have also had the diversity as a, our greatest weakness. Um, so we're at a very point, and this is where I think literature comes in to help provide some sort of equilibrium. Um, we can have, particularly in a world where you see this sort of um, cultural conflict, um, finding increasing currency, I think that we have lessons for, the, for what's going on right now, because even, have, even as we've been dysfunctional, we're not, um, I, would, I won't say yet, but we're not, we have never descended into a truly failed state. <laughs> we've been on the brink several times, but um, we've not descended there. So yeah, that, our, our diversity is, is both the best thing and the worst thing about us. I'm, um, I like to serve Californication, <clears throat> and there was a, a quote that the main character said, um, I drink, I think, I type. And <laughs> that, that, that is largely the process. Much of the writing I've done here, um, in Iowa City, for example, has been done um, in bars <laughs> up to last night. Um, and you sort of flow when it is that you're relaxed and you're... Um, so that, that is, that is it's, a, it's own rush in itself. Um, I guess for, as with most writers, the major challenge is um, when it is that you are in that flow, anything that interrupts it, <laughs> whether it is um, the reality of work, reality of um, family life, um, or just having to, I guess, deal with the external world. Um, I like to say that um, I use the word earlier that, I, um, that I, I've often used myself. I mean, my friends over the years have accustomed to me um, <coughs> being social, being, you know, thing, and then they don't hear from me like two weeks. <laughs> and uh, nobody can call me, nobody can contact me. And um, that, that I usually call that period my hibernation. Of course, I'm doing anything but hibernating. I'm doing a great deal of work. And so usually, um, I'm particularly in a country that people have not, people are not accustomed to the process of literature. Um, the people that are closest to me have, all, have often wondered, I mean, how is it you have a book? Or how is it you have these stories? And when did you do this, this particular work? Um, but it's usually an accumulative process. And then I just shut away and um, try to avoid the distractions. The question I'm, I'm, I'm guessing is that <coughs> whether a writer's writing has a public duty. <coughs> um, and that is usually the, the, the dichotomy. Is it art for art's sake or art for social purpose? Um, the thing is writers, and you've seen it in people like um, Vaclav Havel, for example, um, and we, he spoke about um, the sort of myth of um, specialization where some people are basically um, have to deal with the world's um, pressures directly and some people are specializing just writing about it uh, and just writing. The writer 
has an aesthetic role, um, it has to do with the art, um, examination of issues, large issues like beauty and um, greater, um, less transient questions of um, existence, etc. <laughs> but if you're writing about um, existential um, concerns and people are being shot down in the streets, <laughs> um, who are you writing for? So f f I've seen it as my duty to write about write poetry, about my personal life, about the, about the things that impress me. Um, but I've also seen to write both poetry and fiction about very direct things, very um, precise and present issues that deal that I think have resonance overall. So and I've and I've written about that in. Um, in the newspapers, for example, um, letters, um, columns, etc. And I think that that a writer has a particular talent of, and the, the and the, story, the excerpt I read, read, read was about the whole concept of if it is that this sort of tribal divisive eloquence dominates the space, and you see it happening in America right now, then what happens is that it's not a Others who are less vocal um, don't eventually get to a point where they they know the answers, but um, it it the it, it sort of dwarfs and atrophies uh, a response to the tribalism, um, and for me the role of a writer, particularly in a society as ours that has been tribal. It's to sort of shout down those voices. Um, and yeah, that, that, that's been my public role. I think that the states, and that's why I work in policy, I think that states should support the policy framework um, in which that makes an environment for the creation of literature possible. Um, we, have a, we have a Ghana Prize for Literature. Um, and how it was originally designed, yes, there was, um, it was designed to mitigate bias, um, etc. But its its funding still depends primarily on the state. And so if it is that, and it's happened in the past, if they don't want to host a prize because they're not, they don't like that people like myself have won it, they withdraw. Um, what the state should do is create the environment, um, Copyright, we have copyright legislation, for example, or copyright legislation is 60 years old and completely ineffective. My task, working with the state, is to create copyright policy that supports the viable production of literature. Um, so in that way, yes, the state should support literature, but only in creating the environment, the environment in which the creation of literature is possible. I, I write, as I said, I write poetry, and um, I think the text that has been, I think, most influential for me as a writer is a, a massive book-length poem by Derek Walcott called Another Life, and um, which sort of, sort of as a, I think, the poetic equivalent, equivalent of um, Bill Dooney's roman. And um, it traces his development um, in St. Lucia, um, his artistic development, um, to his to his um, life in the U.S. and his engagement with the society. And he spoke about um, being blessed with a new world naked, um, with Adam's gift of giving name to things. And as I said, in Ghana, we we we're, a society in which that literature has not been able to <laughs> exercise its, itself. Um, so for me, as an, as a, somebody who's now, who now started writing about, I was about 16, 17, 15, um, reading another life um, and seeing sort of parallel about what is possible um, in creating a literature of place. And he, had, he did, Walker deals with liter a literature of place in other poems. Um, like he has one called Hick Jacket. Um, which influenced me not just to write about the place, but more importantly to stay in the place as I'm writing about it. Because very often we have the, um, <laughs> what I call absentee literacy, wherein people 
spend a very small time in the place, but then go and sort of behave as if they have a lease on explaining that place in literature that is very often far removed from the experience of that place over time. Certainly time to write um, has been critical to helping me to produce stuff. Um, I had to go buy a new notebook last night um, because the one I have and I've had for years is quickly falling, um, filling. Um, the being here, well, uh, I've always had a sort of tangential interest in American American politics and American culture, um, as is, as is inevitable. Um, However, being here has given me a sort of insight that sort of propelled me into working less on the screenplays that I've, I focus on finishing and um, looking towards a, a non-fiction project that um, deals with uh, this particular capsule of time in America and its particular significance. Um, and I've sort of, sort of playing around with the whole concept of um, fall, as in the season, <coughs> and sort of parallel to the sort of YC, it seems to be a consensus that American politics um, has sort of descended. <laughs> um, so the working title for now is called An American Fall, and it, 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 um, it examines those issues um, in a variety of fronts. and as informed by the places, we, places we've traveled to. So um, Washington and New York <laughs> um, should be um, extensively fruitful, but we've, um, being in New Orleans, for example, and seeing the parallels of the plantation economy and how um, that has sort of still has resonance for t um, today in America, as, as, as the plantation economy in Ghana still has resonance today in Ghana. Um, for example, we were at a, a plantation and not far from that was another one um, used to call Angola um, which became transformed into was today the Angola prison um, and in Chicago we were at um, a, a, a talk by Albert Wood Fox who was recently released from um, from Angola from the because of black band activities in the um, 70s. Uh, there's currently a documentary out called 13th, which speaks on the 13th Amendment, which sort of covers the transition from <coughs> involuntary slavery to slavery that is allowable extend, um, essentially as a consequence of being convicted, uh, being a, um, a convicted criminal. And, um, there's a lot, a lot of dynamic that goes on. Um, the commercial prison system, um, high incarceration rates disproportionately um, for African Americans, for example. Um, that still has resonance today and has, that is having a peak resonance in this period. So there's a lot of things that are going on that I don't think, quite frankly, an American writer being part of the system Kind of would not necessarily observe in its in its totality. This is this is this program um, has been invaluable. I think that uh, it it offers going forward an opportunity um, because how unique it is and how expansive it is. And I don't think there's anyone like it in the U.S. Um, it offers an opportunity for, I think, America to have not just a new engagement with the rest of the world, but with America itself. Um, if it is that the voices, and if it, if it is that you, there's a, there's a medium for taking advantage of the perspectives that people have um, coming into here, and not just into the program, but into American society. You have, you have the benefit of writers and multiple perspectives um, on this very powerful and very important country.